Major support for these broadcasts is provided by New York Community Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chelsea Lighting, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, The Wickhoff Group, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, M&T Bank. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, Bruce Mosler, C.B. Richard Ellis, Colliers International, New York, LLC, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, DDG Partners, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Flushing Bank, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis, Red Apple Group, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, and These Friends. So we have a hurricane. We have a potential nor'easter. We have an election. We have all of these perfect storm. I hate to say true perfect storm. And we had a year of investment sales that everyone sitting with me was happy because it was happy days. We're here again. So my question is, as we sit here on November 6th, how's the investment market look? Where is it going? Who's buying? Where, what, what's going to happen? My guest today includes Shimon Shikori. Uh, founder and president of Ario Property Partners, Ofer Cohn, who is the founder uh, and principal of Terra CRG, David Sheckman, who is a principal at Easton Consolidated, and last but never least, Aaron Youngrice, who is the principal CEO of Rosewood Realty Group. So, Mr. Uh, Youngrice, you had uh, a little damage at your home. Uh, Mr. Sheckman, you had a little damage. Fortunately, Mr. Shikori and I live in Manhattan, and we didn't have much, and uh, Ofer was lucky over there in Park Slope. What effect do you believe this may have to change the, the way, you know, this was a great year. You were going to do close to, you may still do close to a billion dollars in sales. Did over already. Okay, you did over a billion dollars. Mazel tov. So my question is, you know, there are seven weeks left to the year. What effect is the storm, the election, because we don't know, you know I'm not, uh, Kreskin, the, 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 the guy who says what, who's going to win. What effect do you see this on the investment sales market? Uh, it, I think it's going to have a minimal effect. I, it will definitely have some type of effect. People are jittery, some people are scared, but as long as rates are low, and this is a very rate-fueled market, it will continue. But your colleague, Mr. Sheckman, you know, that's why you're together, because sometimes you join the effort and do deals together. Mr. Sheckman has a different point of view. Didn't you say to me prior to the show that uh, the, the world is really, uh, you know, people want to put out money, everything, you know, maybe there's a temporary couple of days, you know, it's like when somebody has a loss of a family member or something, they, they worry about it and then they go back to normal. Uh, I, last week I received some interesting emails from high net worth individuals, all bona fide and, and credible folks, um, and some from outside of New York with interest in New York, and uh, they were sincere in extending uh, well wishes for whomever we know who's hurt or, or, or uh, people with whom we work. 
but they were also very serious um, about their offers to come in and uh, be a source of equity, be creative, uh, take partial ownership. If people are hurt, if they're not insured, if they own real estate in some fashion and they uh, are unwilling sellers, perhaps they're interested in joint ventures or somehow monetizing whatever they hold um, in a somewhat favorable way. And what's driving it is not only record low rates, it's the lack of product. Because the rates are so low and equity is pent up and the sentiment globally, and it's a very New York-centric statement, is to rush to New York, to rush to quality with all this equity, people are now willing to buy in areas that aren't necessarily Madison Avenue and Main Street in New York. You, you don't think that certain local investors and domestic investors are going to say, you know, the taxes are going up, capital gains are going up from 15 to 20 percent, you know, there's an additional tax if you earn over $200,000. There's a 3.8% tax. There's uh, other changes over there. You don't think this is going to have an effect on the investment sales, Ofa? I think there's a huge difference. I mean, we have to look at it. There's a micro and there's a macro. <clears throat> All right. So on the micro, we have probably the best, like you said, one of the best years we've had in the investment sales market. Uh, and I think most of it is because of the great fundamentals of the micro economy of New York City employment, um, rental market is on fire, scarcity of product, money from all over the world coming to New York wanted to want to take advantage of relatively safe market. Uh, elsewhere is not as, 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 as comfortable like in places like Europe and China. And I think this is the micro and the micro is going to continue to drive this market through next year. I think on the macro level of taxation and politics and a hurricane here and there at the these things take a long time to affect our market, and we may not see the effect of what's going on right now for until the middle of next year. Shimon? I think that for a very short period of time, we'll feel it. I mean, it's a devastating um, event that took place in New York City. But I think that we'll see, you know, probably by the end of, maybe by the end of the first quarter or somewhere later this year, next year, we'll see that uh, the fundamentals, like Offer said, are going to win. I mean, if you look at the residential market, it's been the highest it's ever been. It's uh, higher than 2007. Um, and it's not going to stop because the demand for that market, the demand for uh, rental product is there. Interest rates are low. And, and if you look at the vacancy rates today, they're at 2.1, where in 2007 you had them at 2.5, with unemployment, that's half of what it is today. Now, here, here's an interesting point. We, we have many people, they don't even know the numbers yet for displaced citizens of New York City. Now, some of them are displaced from the city housing projects. Some of them are displaced, you know, they are wealthy people who are staying in hotels or other situations over there. But there is this displaced people. So, and we have a limited hotel stock. Uh, not a, we have a limited hotel stock, but we also have a limited residential stock of what and what's going to be built over there that you can't really absorb this. Um, do you think that rents are going to go even higher for residential rentals? I think they will. People are still running to come here, and this is the center of the world. Like Dave said before, New York centric. Everyone loves coming to Manhattan. Michael, remember the new... Remember, we have Mr. Brooklyn here. Okay. Brooklyn, too. Brooklyn scene. Brooklyn, has, Brooklyn, 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 Brooklyn I, I mean, I, I joke okay. with Bruce Mosley. I mean, I, hey, I, I haven't been invited to the Barclays Center. You know, I want to go to Brooklyn. <laughs> Let's go. I have tickets to the okay. game next week. You know, Ofer, there was an article that people are priced out of Park Slope and Williamsburg, so they're moving Absolutely. to the Upper East Side. Who would have thunk that? Do you remember the New Yorker's cartoon, the New Yorker cartoon from either the late 70s or early 80s? It was a picture of Manhattan, a sliver of New Jersey, and then the rest of the United States. That's a great picture. That was a great point of view. That's but you have to keep in mind, to Aaron's point, when we say the world is looking at New York, for the past 36 months, I think in all of our businesses, on the lending and advising side, Michael, you're seeing uh, pockets of wealth from all over the world look at New York. And the one metric that sticks in my mind, and uh, I'm not the best person, I may be off by uh, uh, you know one or two percent, in places like Paris, London, perhaps Hong Kong, 
the percentage of post-tax dollars that are spent on somebody's housing exceeds 65, 70 percent. It's some stratospheric number. In New York, notwithstanding the rents that people like Ofer Yardani and wonderful providers are achieving at 60, 70, 80 dollars a foot, um, you're still only spending in New York on the average 42 or 43 percent of your post-tax yeah, dollars but, on but, rent. But There's room for growth. You see, the, the rule around the country was somebody, a family, shouldn't be spending more than 30 percent of their income uh, on their rent. So when you're talking about 43 percent, to me, that's still a high number. And I believe that in many cases, for the younger people, it's even higher because they're paying, they want to be in Murray Hill or they want to be somewhere else or they want to be in downtown Brooklyn now. They're, or Williamsburg, they're paying 50 percent. That's um, accurate. And what happens is that's fine and dandy, and I still remember Mr. Yardeni being on one of my panels when 2009 hit and you couldn't rent the apartments, you know, people were using more electricity, more power, you know, or, and all the rest. So, I mean, I'm, I'm still questioning how high rents could go because I think it's a question of how much somebody can afford to pay for their apartment. You know, when do you call uncle? It's a, it's a little too high. Let's, let's talk about, you know, different aspects of the investment sales market today a, as you look at it. You sold recently a hotel, which I think is the Hotel of Brooklyn, um, even though my good friends at Hersha own the new hotel in Brooklyn, which is the new hotel over there. The Bossert was where the Brooklyn Dodgers was. It was a beautiful thing. It was owned by the Jehovah's, and the Jehovah's maintained it great. Um, was it an auction? Did a lot of people want this type of property? Because it's, they were, Brooklyn is so hot today. I think a lot of people wanted it, but it was an off-market deal, so it didn't really go into the hands of many buyers. No. But I think the guys who bought it paid a very healthy number. But ultimately, because it's Brooklyn Heights and Brooklyn is as hot as, hot as anything, I think they'll succeed and they'll do now, well. Now, when we talk about, let's talk about that. Where in Brooklyn today, because you specialize in Brooklyn, do you see the, the highest place, the, where, the, where the people are going? Because we, we spoke before about Red Hook. And we brought up the fact, uh, I'm not sure if it was David who said, you know, he really got devastated, but they don't really have that much. But it's nice. I mean, but it's, it's a nice area, terrible transportation, limited services, but... Well, the hottest, you know, there was a huge demographic, demographic shift in Brooklyn in the last five, seven, eight years. And the, this new demographic is expecting a completely different lifestyle experience from where they live and what they're getting. And Williamsburg is approaching the low 60s now. Jeff Levin is planning a new tower uh, on the waterfront, and downtown Brooklyn is in the low 50s, mid 50s, and uh, the biggest issue that we're facing right now is that there's a lot of demand for housing, and there's a demand for institutional investors to buy uh, the end product, right, but, but there's not enough. Okay, here, here's my question, because all of you represent local investors, institutional investors, foreign investors. I used to always say, how many institutional investors are going to say, I want to live, I want to buy a building in Long Island City. That comment that I made is wrong because H&M, mm -hmm. you know, the Canadian REIT bought Gotham Center. Sure. Uh, you know, Manual Life bought an office building in Jersey City. So that's not the situation today. But there are sections because of the hurricane, because of the erosion, because of the, the, the A category where people are going to maybe be a little more cautious, right? What do you think? I think that people will be more cautious, but if you talk about waterfront properties, you have to ask yourself again about demand. I don't think that people will necessarily stop buying, you know, uh, waterfront properties. I think their insurance will go up, so it's going to be harder to, to maintain, and the cost to build is going to probably be higher because of code changes or whatnot, so, um, so it's going to be more costly to buy there. But I what, don't think the demand will change. Now, let's talk about development land. There, there are a limited amount of development land in the five boroughs. Um, what's the most expensive? Is land, I know you sell a number of development lands and other properties. Where do you see land today, you know, for new development? Very timely question. Um, Chelsea, $410 a foot for a 44-foot wide mid-block parcel in the 20s. This is a bankruptcy auction. Um, I, I believe we're going to exceed the stalking horse bid. 400 a foot, 450 uh, per foot hard and soft to finish it, 
10% contingency. Your basis in a finished product, if everything goes well, is just under 1,000 a foot. Can you sell condos for 2,000 a foot? The data supports it today. Let's talk about- Can you do it with, without tax abatements like 421As? There are people who believe you can because we have, there are hard non-refundable contracts and bids which actually exceed the ask. But w let's talk about the boroughs. Um, Queens, there are- Queens is like a tale of many cities <laughs> because people f forget that there's something called the Rockaways. The Rockaways and Breezy Point, there's nothing. There's nothing happening. There's nothing going to happen over there for a period of time. Flushing may be a different category. Flushing, okay, Kew Gardens, you know, Forest Hills. I'm not sure about Jamaica, but, you know, I think it's a tale of different cities. So let's talk then about the latter, the areas that you highlighted where we know retail has um, always existed on a smaller level, and now you see big box and you see institutional investment in retail in, in Flushing and Jamaica and even places like Corona. I, I could tell you that... Uh, 200, 300,000 square foot developments in this environment shortly post Sandy um, are still very uh, sought after. And I believe that you will see two. You mean for urban retail? For retail and residential development. I think you will see 2013 um, acquisitions, significant acquisitions of 100,000 to 400,000 square foot parcels. And I believe, and I hope, um, the election will play a part, but I believe you will also have construction financing in those neighborhoods. Now, in fairness, Michael, even in this hot environment, it is not for every developer. It is still for much higher-end developers. experienced, and, you know, it's over there. You, fortunately, you had a very good year. All of you had a good year. Of the, of the sales that you did, how would you allocate them? How much was multifamily? How much was... Re, uh, you know, retail. And so I would on. say about eight percent was hotel, about two to three percent was retail, about five percent was office, and about eighty-five was multifamily. So you're saying that the multifamily asset was the preferred asset from your buyers and <coughs> sellers. That was the same. Correct. Situation. Absolutely. Same with us. Same with you. In our case, it was a little bit different. There was, I think, it was a rush to buy development sites that were shovel ready before we ran out of land and for us it was almost probably over 40 percent land the land and the rest multifamily and a little bit of retail and you david 50 percent was development in some iteration whether it was fee simple or it was a note sale 25 percent was retail and the remaining 25 percent were the other food let's groups. talk a little bit about retail as i've said many times and i've done num numerous shows on this urban retail does great. Now, when I talk urban retail, you know, you're thinking of national chains, you're thinking of different items over there. What type of retail have you sold this year? Just local taxpayers. Mom and pops? Yeah, exactly. So with retail down on the bottom, some apartments up on top. And some retail, no, some actually strips. Six stores, ten stores. What type of tenancies? The pizza Mom place? and pop, yeah, okay. exactly. Not, no, no, uh, no name type? No. So that type of property, right. people like that situation. Urban, it's very urban. Right, because uh, there's a board, there's a member of a board of a, a prominent bank who likes retail, I think you know him, and that's what he likes. You know, the mom and pops, he, and he's not worried. And I got a comment from George Klett, who runs Signature Bank. He likes that type of financing, as opposed to certain other people, like for maybe Capital One, they'd rather have a better tenant mix over there. And yourself, what about you? What type of properties are when, on the retail and so on? We sold, we sell mostly mixed use buildings. So if there's gonna be a retail store on the bottom, similar to Aaron, um, you know, it's uh, small mom and pop shops. We sold one Citibank, which was an outlier, up, mm. up in 140th and- well, You know, a couple of years ago when David was waiting for his bar mitzvah, because you know, he's the youngest one of the group over here. All of you are over 40 and I'm just, two years older than you, uh, over here. You know, there was, uh, there was a hype, and you, did, you were a specialist in this at one time. There was a lot of developments and a lot of properties that people wanted to go north of 96th Street in Harlem. We do a do, lot of that. Do we see that? Is there still that uh, 
zest uh, for uh, Harlem today and what's happening in Harlem? Yeah, ab absolutely exists. Um, the prices per buildable in Harlem today went up from their 50s and 60s two or three years ago closer to 70, 80 and sometimes $100 per square foot. The players are mostly local players or foreign international backed players that are building smaller, you know, smaller parcels. Um, and I think this, this year you'll see a lot of transactions and and development transactions in uh, in Upper Manhattan. Uh, anybody else in Upper Manhattan? Oh. Do you know where that is? I did most a lot of my <laughs> business is Upper Manhattan. We sold about thirty two buildings in Upper Manhattan this year. One was no, wait, okay. So Upper when I talk about Upper Manhattan and I think maybe Shimon's explanation of Upper Manhattan, I was really talking more of the Harlem. You're maybe talking more of the Inwood or the Washington no, no, Heights. No, I'm talking north of 96th Street. I, I Amsterdam, Columbus, mm. more Audubon going up to Seaman Avenue, all those areas where we're selling Fort Wash, Pinehurst. So that's Washington Heights, Harlem, and Manhattan Valley. Mm. And there's significant interest there. I think uh, north of 96, straight through uh, the hospital, uh, Washington Heights. W what surprised me this year, and, and, and we've sold probably uh, seven or eight hundred units in and around those neighborhoods in the past six months, the retail, uh, the appreciation for retail there, all of the mom and pops that somehow have been cobbled together, and uh, you know, not to cast aspersions on a mom and pop retail, uh, but you're getting bigger box, um, bigger names. First it was a bodega, and then it may have morphed into a... Um, Dunkin' Donuts. A Dunkin' Donuts, or a... And now a 7-Eleven. Or Verizon. But, but you're also seeing some very enterprising mom and pop. You're seeing some wonderful bars and gastro pubs and some... Uh, you can get a $7 latte in Washington Heights and actually sell a lot of them. You couldn't do that six years ago. Retail is driving the city from Inwood to the financial district. What, what about the hospitality industry? I mean, you had your one one sale over here. How do you see the hospitality? I, I still walk around Manhattan and I see former parking lots and garage sites where, and I say, oh, another building is going up, you know, 43rd Street, 50th Street, 36th Street. Well, I mean, it's like every side street, you know, there's at least one or two new hotels and all of them have rooftop bars because, you know, mm -hmm. that's the, the nuance of the world. Do you see that happening? Do you, are there sites, development sites, still being sold for hotels? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you can deliver, if you have a willing seller with anywhere from 46 to 100 feet of frontage, even if it's mid-block from the 20s to 50s, you could sell that site for $300 a foot. And in some instances, and I dare say some brokers would suggest more, but 300 a foot. Not my gentleman over here, no. But I could tell you that if, if you can deliver a 50 by 100 site, even if it's mid-block in the 30s, between 7th and 10th, Michael, I think you know full well there are a dozen folks. You wouldn't need to go beyond 12 people to get 300 a foot. We just did one in the West 30s, what he just said. And it was 50 by 100, exact size. For a hotel. For a hotel, and it's a mid-block, and there's a tenant in there on the retail, and you still have to buy them out, and it went for about 340 a foot. Mm. We, we're not seeing Brooklyn. Yeah, we're not seeing that excitement about hotel development. Well, what about you know? The, but there was so much excitement, you know, with Williamsburg, you know, with the opening of the Barclays Center. Right. What's happening with the sites around the Barclays Center? That's a great question. Uh, Barclays Center was probably the, the most interesting and the most important thing that happened to Brooklyn in the last, I don't know, over a decade. Forty years. No, probably. It, no, it really probably. No, Metro Tech and was important. This is this is right. More and important. so we we've been very active around the Barclays Center. We recently sold. We talked about retail. We sold uh, the the only freestanding uh, retail building across the street, literally across the street from Barclays Center, the Triangle Building. It used to be uh, how big of a building was it's it? It's a small building, but we reach over 900 a foot on three-story building. So like what are they going to? They're the targeting 200 to 250 a foot in rents for restaurants. Yeah, restaurant and or. Um, you know, single tenant type bank type use. That's Soho pricing. That's uh, now. Well, I mean, it's 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 comparable. The rents that they're shooting for are comparable to the Fulton Mall, that also has seen. No, the Fulton Mall in downtown Brooklyn ha has done well. What about you know? And this, I think, it's very important. You know, I, I read and I, I know that there have been properties in Lower Manhattan that have been hurt due to the hurricane. Do you see right now any? Um, the interest in Lower Manhattan? 
has it been strong? Or? Well, I, th I mean, we, we're marketing now a development site there, and again, it's too early to determine how it's going to fare out after the, the storm, but I mean, the people that looked at it before and negotiated a price with us are not you know, talking to us. So um, from our perspective, the demand is the same. Clearly, because of the storm, because of the flood, people are going to think twice about it between now and... Now, what about the Bronx? You know, we, we've spoken about other places. We've spoken about Brooklyn, Manhattan. We haven't spoken about Staten Island, but there's not much to talk about because there hasn't been that many developments. What's happening in the Bronx? I mean, at one time, you, you could buy land for 20 bucks a foot, developable foot. Not today, I don't think. No, oh, but the Bronx is probably one of the only places where you can get an actual yield today. I mean, you can buy things at a six plus cap rate, which means an eight or nine percent cash on cash. Um, you have to know how to manage the property and take care of vacancy, et cetera. Um, but I don't think that's going to last for a long time. I think that as we go into 2013 and if our prediction is right and the rental market and the multifamily market is going to go even higher in terms of pricing, you'll see a cap rate compression in the Bronx as well. So definitely a, a buy opportunity today. I, I don't want to be negative. Anything happening in Staten Island before, uh, before uh, the hurricane? Well, BFC just announced, uh, Don Capocha just announced a big retail project. Yes, it was a retail project with the Ferris wheel mm -hmm. on the water. So I'm mm -hmm. not certain of the, the opportunity, if that's really going to happen. I think they're going to have to build a, uh, Let's see. you know, over, over the platform. There. We've had some activity, uh, believe it or not, in and around the St. George area this year. And I think uh, we've seen some of our colleagues have actually sold some of the stalled, um, some well and some poorly conceived development sites, uh, the Purit sites and some of the waterfront sites. Um, they've traded hands. There is activity there. Oh, there, there has been. I, I know my own colleagues, uh, they bought one of those sites and, you know, they got control of the property and I know that Meadow Partners uh, that's the one bought, I'm talking bought, bought about. another site and they took control over there and I believe that's happened in a variety of, with like one minute left our investment on note sales still happening from the banks not by the special services yes they are um, and they are uh, very uh, there's a ton of zeal there's a ton of interest but there is much less product banks are much healthier yeah, I agree. I mean, we have a few notes that we're still selling, but I don't think we'll see much of it in the next uh, year or so. Last question. All of a sudden, there have been a lot of new brokerage firms coming up. Do you see this, you know, Avison and Young was created, Lee and Associates were, was created. I mean, you guys are a couple years old in business now. Do you see, any, okay, do you see any more new entities being created because everybody wants to be uh, an investment sales broker or in the, in the brokerage business in New York? Michael. Uh, let me Aaron. He's been too quiet. I don't think there will be any more. There have been so many break-offs. It's like shul. You know, you have three guys <laughs> going, then they want to start another one. I've never seen more break-offs. I like that one. That's it's a, true. It's true. I, it's amazing. So, so they, they, they saw their own new congregation, yes. right? Yes, okay. exactly. So it's Rosewood <clears throat> too. Right. Rosewood. Well, Rosewood so far has remained whole. Okay. but I think you sell it through, uh, throughout the uh, down cycle. I mean, new companies usually start in down cycles, and um, I think you won't see that much of it in the next okay. year. So I, I think that, you know, uh, on this election day, uh, we've got some pretty good ideas. Uh, in the new year, I will invite all of you back. And I'd like to thank uh, my friend Shimon, uh, Ofer, David, and uh, Aaron. And I'll see you next week.